This is Rob Tebbett for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted to be joined again by Shane McGuigan in the immediate aftermath of Josh Taylor's stunning majority decision. I had to have a little think there. Win over Regis Program in the World Boxing Super Series final. Shane, first and foremost, congratulations on another terrific win. Thank you very much, Rob. It's as early for us, isn't it? It's, it's only 1.48 because the clocks have gone back. Did you know that? I was told that this morning, but I, I actually what forgot. That? Yeah, yeah I just, I, I'm going to relish an extra hour in bed. So, um, yeah, amazing, amazing. I mean, I, the emotions of tonight was just incredible. You know, myself and Josh haven't had an easy camp. You know, um, at the start of it, I lost my sister. Terrible, terrible tragic events just that happened so fast and it was like a whirlwind and Josh was always messaging me and then a f you know in the set, uh, middle of September he lost uh, his girlfriend Danielle he lost his soon to be father you know he would have been his father-in-law so James and uh, yeah I mean it's just it's terrible it's terrible and that happened within a week so uh, for the outcome to to be unified world champion and and uh, WBA, IBF, Ring Magazine, Muhammad Ali Trophy winner. I mean, you just couldn't script it. You know, you couldn't script it. It's not been an easy road. It's been it's been a very very tough uh, tough one at that. But we sat here at close to three, but saying two uh, in the morning, and yeah, my emotions are are all over the place. That was something that uh, Josh echoed as well. Um, obviously, it's been a very difficult time for him, as it has for yourself, um, which we've spoken about. Um, he stru struck me as somebody who doesn't quite know what he's achieved yet. Um, I'm not sure when he's going gonna, he's gonna to find that out. Do you, do you agree with that, from kind of speaking with him in the immediate aftermath? I just maybe, maybe think it's the fact that he doesn't, he doesn't want to believe, believe his own hype. You know? I think he kn he's got a very good family around him that keep him nice and grounded got all these belts his life's changed dramatically in a very short space of time um, and I think you know he doesn't he doesn't want to claim superstardom I mean you know he knows that he has to sell fights He's, it reminds me a lot of Callum Smith it's like you know they both can fight like fuck um, excuse my French but the two of them don't really want to go out there and you know showcase and prance around and and act the big in so they're both they're both very personable guys and you know that's exactly what Josh is. He doesn't he doesn't want to doesn't want to be like progress. He doesn't want to be, you know, showcasing himself and hanging out with movie stars. He just wants to he wants to be uh, having a pint of pans in 30 years time and just knowing that he's achieved his goals and that's what he set out to do and that is, you know, be the best fighter he can be and, and that's taken him this far. Before we come on to talking about the fight and what a fight it was. Um how much of a motivation and I mean we've saw we've seen Josh in the past at press conferences kind of have some choice words and, and you know sort of boil over at times but this week it, it really struck me about him really wanting to prove people wrong I don't think Josh appreciated the fact that he was the underdog coming into this fight do you think that's fair to say? Yeah I mean he was the underdog but in the UK he was the, the Sky team would have had him as, the, as a favourite, but in, in America they, they had Progre as the as the favourite. I know on the bookies he was a slight underdog, but um, he relishes that. Yeah, you know, he relishes that moment um, against. I another another example is is uh, against Sahara Davies. He was the betting underdog against that, and he and he rose to the occasion. It's just that's what he likes to do, and uh, and you know that's that, that's that's. That's him, you know. He, he he likes to be put up against it. And he definitely was tonight, and it was a hard, hard, hard fight. You know, he, he uh, started well. I mean, a lot of people had him down, but he was making he was making Regis fight his fight from early on. You know, it, Regis is a guy that he likes space. He likes to sit back. He likes to slow the pace down. The whole tactics was you got to you got to make sure that transition from long range to short range. Is, is rapid and when you're on the inside he switches off Progre you know uh, as the fight went on he's adapted that's what that's that's someone that is an amazing fighter in his own right 
he adapted, he started working on the inside as well because he knew he had to. But, you know, Josh picked up enough momentum and rounds and when he picked up momentum and then Proger would have a good round and then he'd have to sway it and change it again and it was just a back and forth fight the whole way through. And, uh, you know, it definitely wasn't easy. It's not been an easy road. He's just come off the back of two very hard fights. Uh, two unbeaten, actually three unbeaten guys. Um, and two very, very, very tough fights. And I think he just has a good old rest now. I think I read somewhere that his last four opponents have a combined record of 95 and 1. Well, uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was 94 or 96. So I'm glad that you've got 95 because that's right in the middle but if 95 and 1 it doesn't really matter he's the he's the O snatcher it, it, to be fair it could have been 94 95 or 96 but it is very late so we'll forgive me if I'm wrong um, the start of the fight a lot of people had pro grey ahead after four rounds was there, was there anything that you that you didn't expect from him in those early stages did he impress you he impressed a lot of people at ringside um, no it was exactly what we expected um, he t uh, he took a better shot than I expected actually um you know, I seen Relic hit him at the end of the second round and it was after the bell and his legs dipped and I thought, okay, that that's his chink, you know, he might especially he looks a little bit soft around his belly. I thought, you know, Josh should be able to get him with some, some good body shots, but he's tough as nails. Not only is he a good good fighter, a good skillful fighter, a good puncher, he's tough as nails. So, um, you know, he was a very, very, very hard fight for, for Josh tonight. But um, I think the pace the pace ate him up and he, he had to fight he had to expend too much more energy than he's used to and someone like Josh is used to fighting at that pace that tempo and he set it a lot even though he might have lost rounds he was still in control of the pace because he was forcing it you know Pro Gator he's a straight up counter puncher obviously he can he, he can mix it on the inside but he loves guys walking onto him and he loves space and that's something that you know especially after the ninth he come back to me after the ninth round before the 10th he says, Shane, I can't see out my eye. I says, well, we need these last two rounds. It's not like you can go and mess about for two rounds. He says, you need to stay on his chest. You have to get in close because someone like Progre as well, when he's got distance, he's, he's really dangerous. So if you can't see out of one eye, you're getting hit with a blind shot. It's just you have to stay in on him. You have to stay in on his chest. He can't fight your pace on the inside nudge him, use your size, use your strength in there and you know he he, uh, he prevailed. That's interesting to hear, I mean I was going to ask about that um, obviously the clash of heads um, that was late in the fight but talk to me about the early rounds I'm sure you, I mean you've just mentioned would have, would have kind of expected that kind of start from Pro Grey but having known Josh for fairly well for a couple of years, two or three years I'm sure he wouldn't have been happy to feel like he potentially was giving up those early rounds what did you say to him say in between for example after four rounds or three or four rounds yeah. yeah what did you say well I just said I, I said after the first couple I said Josh you know you can't let him out jab you because you know these rounds are close but you're letting him out jab you letting him out outwork you and that's something that battery issue uh, three o'clock in the morning so we'll forgive that um, it's actually the second one uh, I'm going to yes. mention it before Shane does um, early rounds that Josh gave up um, I'm sick of hearing this question. It's the third time I've asked you it in 10 minutes. Uh, what were you saying to Josh in between rounds to, to kind of... to keep him on task, really, and, and keep him focused on the game plan? Well, yeah, I mean, I, like... As I was saying before, the battery, the battery died. Exactly. Twice. Uh, that, you know, even though he was losing some rounds um, early on, he was forcing pro grade to work. The most important thing in, in our game plan was that Pro Grey, he's, he's a lazy fighter. He's a powerful fighter, but he's lazy and he likes space. So, you, you know, you needed to get in, you needed to get in on his chest. And Josh on the inside is a, is a phenomenal fighter. He can work the head and the body. He can rip, you know, rip him up, up the middle. Um, and it was just, you know, you, you're losing some rounds. You get, you're making him work, but you just need to jab a little bit more. Jab your way in, sustain your attack, don't 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 just be there for you know two or three shots and then drop back out of distance. Sustain the attack. He hates it on the inside. Make him fight you know two three phases on the inside and then as soon as he starts to get his rhythm and start moving his head because he's got good head movement, drop out of distance. Then get back on your jab and it really that change of tempo that change of range was really frustrating. Progress and it 
it got it allowed us to pick up enough rounds in those early to middle rounds to late rounds that that you know that he was he was uh, ahead. We mentioned earlier on in the interview um, about the eye injury from the clash of heads. How bad was it? How difficult is it when something like that happens? And ultimately, how is Josh now? Um, well, it's, it, it was a bad head cut. You know, it was a bad cut. It was a head clash. I think it was about the eighth round, maybe. Uh, was it? I mean, it definitely. The, the fact is that he came back after the after the ninth round, before the tenth. So Shane, I can't see out of the eye, and that's never a good thing to hear, um, especially when you're in with a puncher. So. I was like, look, Josh, if you stand off him, you're going to get nailed, right? Um, he, he never mentioned his power before that. He never said, oh, you know, he's, he's punch. I, mean, I asked him about his uh, progress of power. He says, yeah, he's, he's heavy handed, but I can see it. You know, you, and as soon as you can see a shot, you can brace, you can, you, know, you can take the sting off it. But then a worrying factor for me is that, you know, he can't see anything out of the right side. So, and that's. Progress, you know, he's a southpaw on against the southpaw. That's progress, his best side to his left hand. So I said, Josh, you need to stay in close. You just look, don't give him any space. One, you're effective in there, and we need these last two rounds. And two, as soon as you step out of distance, this guy's going to be fucking lethal. So get in, make sure that transition from long to short is fast. And when you're in there, rough him up, pull him, you know, use your strength. You're a bigger, you're a naturally bigger man than him bully him on the inside and you know it, it paid it paid dividends you mentioned kind of the size of Josh and that was something that was spoken about heading into the fight um, something that Regis Progress spoke a lot about heading into the fight um, how is he at the weight I mean we spoke beforehand and you told me that he was he was you know he was fine he was on the weight for a long time I know he's inevitably going to be asked questions now about moving up to 147 pounds did there was there anything in the fight that made you think any differently about his weight no, not at all. I mean, it's his, it's his career weight. You know, he's a, he was a 60 kilo in the, in the amateurs when he went to the Olympics. He moved up to 64. Um, he feels great at that weight. It's, it's a weight that we have a size advantage, but at the same time, we, he's very, very effective at, at that weight. You know, moving up to 147 pounds is a potential option, but I, I, he's a career 140, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's never easy to make the weight, but he definitely does it well. And he hydrates just like a normal per person to, you know, 150, 354 pounds. And, um, and that's very strong. The guys that are going in 147, they're putting an extra 14 pounds on and they're naturally bigger guys. So the fact that he's, uh, he's born in 91, he's January the 4th. So he's, the fact that he's 28 years of age is that, you know, he's, uh, he's you know, he's not, he's not going to get much bigger, physically bigger. So... Um, he's not going to fill out anymore. I mean, he does his he does his S and C and stuff. This is our this is our weight. This is our, this is the weight that he's he's at his strongest and at his best. And yeah, you saw it with uh, the likes of Ricky Hatton. He was a he was a phenomenal force at 140 when he moved up to 147. Took the edge off him. And you know, I'm not saying that's going to be the case with Josh, but I if anything, I would rather people meet, meet us in the middle. And you know, we're in a driving seat now. He's got the potential to fight Ramirez. If he beats Ramirez, he's got all four belts. Any of the big names will, uh, we can, we can, you know, we've got, they've got to go into our terms. How did you see the fight? Um, I think one or two eyebrows are raised at the 117-112 scorecard. How did you see it? I mean, I had him winning by, you know, by one or two rounds. I mean, it was close. I, I'm always really harsh. I mean, if there's, if there's a close round, I'm like, it's progress. So, you know, um, Reflecting on it now, I, there's no argument that Progre won the fight. You know, people would have said... It, 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 Taylor. Uh, no, I'm saying there, there would be no argument that, to say, oh, you know, he won that fight. You know, any, I heard one person said, you know, they had Progre up by two, but very few and far between. You know, it's not, it's not, there's no way that's the case. You know, if anything, he'd have potentially... Not even potentially. I mean, you, there, there would be an argument for it to be, you know, uh, Taylor by one or two, but it definitely wasn't wasn't by five rounds or whatever that judge had it. So, I mean, it, you know, I had him I had him up by two, and I think that was it was pretty clear to score the rounds. You know, you could you could see when when Progo was winning the rounds, and you could see when when Taylor was. I mean, I was confident that that we won it, um, but you know, it's uh, you, you you never know until you hear that.
you know, from from the fighting pride of Scotland, Michael Buffer saying that as well. What 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 a moment! Final one on Josh. Where next? Um, obviously, the Jose Ramirez fight, who holds the WBC and the WBO titles, is obviously going to be talked about. Um, Lewis Ritson was talked yeah. about fighting. Obviously, he won a WBA eliminator against Robbie Davis Jr. What would you like to see next for Josh? Um, it, it's boxing's a business, you know, and and ultimately everyone wants to see the Ramirez fight but that doesn't happen overnight you know like it, it's up to the governing bodies everybody in, in, in uh, involved whether it's I think Bob Aaron's got Ramirez and he so he's a ESPN fighter there's two different you know there's well Taylor's also uh, you know he's, he's a free agent as well now so we, you know we, we've got to we've got to let us see um you know, from a management standpoint, we'll sit down with my dad and, and Josh and, and, my, and my brothers and, and we'll m map out where we want to go. I mean, we want to obviously want to have, have the Ramirez fight. If we wait too long, then one of the governing bodies will say, OK, like the IBF or the WBA will say, well, you've got to fight your mandatories within a certain time. And, and then, you, then you're a little bit stumped. So um, we should take that fight relatively soon. But he, he needs a rest. You know, he just needs a rest. We need to see how that eye is getting on. Um, and you know he's come off two very hard fights against Baranchek and um, and uh, Progre, and before that even before the tournament, Victor Postel as well as a hard fight. He's, he's had some serious acid tests, and I'm not going to say he deserves an easy fight, but you, you know it's uh, it, you know, he needs to maybe showcase himself in America against a, an American fighter um, over there. And then, and then the Ramirez fight, or, or whether we fight um, Lewis Richardson. I mean, I think you know, Josh versus him would do a, a hell of a crowd. It will be exciting whilst it lasts. But you know, this is this is the business, and we'll sit and we'll be very, very patient with our next move. Lawrence Acoli picked up the European cruiserweight title. Uh, spoke to Lawrence after the fight. I can't really remember what he said to be honest it's, it's very late what did you think of his performance probably said something like I put the sauce on him he, he uh, said something odd oh, yeah I mean he's an odd bloke but he's a fantastic <laughs> guy he's honestly he's a, he's a joy to train um, great great charisma in the gym trains fucking hard like he trains really hard and that's you know that's just his work rate is his, is his discipline and he doesn't get the credit that he deserves you know he's taken is this his 14th fight or yeah he's his 14th fight he's a Europe I mean Ngarbu's a, a nightmare yeah he'd have been a nightmare for anybody in the, in the cruiserweight division and and you know we we took that fight obviously Ngarbu wanted to fight for a world title and we wanted to fight. We want to. We want to work our way up. But Eddie's like, okay. Well, you need to. Eddie wants to know how good he is. You know, he wants to put him in and and see how if he can really mix it. And I think tonight you've seen that. You know, you've seen that. He. There's some definite uh, improvements, but maybe it wasn't that clear to see. But I, I believe so. I mean, I think like. He was working on the inside really, really well. Uh, he was working on the inside really well. Uh, yeah, he, the, it was a bit messy at times, but that, you know, that's definitely down to Ngarbu, is the fact that he wanted to just set a ferocious pace. They thought that they were just going to tire him out and exhaust him and just um, and catch him in the later rounds. And it seems to be always the case of someone, someone that's boxing Lawrence. They're just saying, all right, let's just really tire him out. But with that, they get close. They have to get close, and I mean, it was a ferocious, ferocious pace. And Lawrence was the guy that that got that got into his rhythm, started started pinging him about, hurt him, you know, throughout the fight, and uh, and took him out. And you know, you can't really. I mean, it was a great great knockout. The referee saved him before he really really stretched him. Uh, Ngarbu was exhausted, and Lawrence was really getting his range and starting to tee off on him. And uh, yeah, I think it was a very it was it was a very sensible stoppage from the referee, but also a huge huge statement from Lawrence Coley. George Groves actually said he thought the stoppage was a little bit premature. George is a hater, isn't he? I love George, but he's a hater. But um, no, I mean, you could say that. You could say it was premature, but 
I, you know, the guy needed oxygen straight afterwards, and he was he was gone. The, he was he, the shot was a phenomenal shot, but he was exhausted. I was looking at him coming out of clinches, and and God was a bully. He's a straight up pressure fighter. He's a bully. He needs to have you on the back foot, on the inside. He needs to be underneath you. And the whole point was for Lawrence to actually drop to his height, drop underneath him, shrug him off, because he gets all his power from just being in that trajectory and, and, and leaning in and, and ripping the uppercut and ripping the body. And so we took the side, he dropped his shoulder, he got underneath him, started shrugging him off and his legs started, you could see um, in Garbo, his legs were getting so heavy, he was exhausted trying to, trying to push him on the inside, trying to bully him. And that was a wrong tactic from Dominic Ingle. Where next for Lawrence Acoli? Um, he's just picked up another title after 13, 14 fights. Um, Eddie said that he'd be happy to, for him to kind of push on, not necessarily to a world title fight, but more a world level fight. Um, would you be happy with that? Definitely. Um, he's he's he never he never wants to to hang about Lawrence. You know, he, even as an amateur, he had a short amateur career. He, he achieved so much so quickly. You know, he he, he needs to be challenged he needs to be challenged to get up for fights because he really believes in his ability I believe in his ability Eddie is probably you know starting to really believe in his ability as well I think everyone is and, and the thing about Lawrence is get, get him a get him a, a Masternick esque sort of fight someone that's a you know a, 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 in and around that level or a, you know um, what's his name the guy that barely, barely knocked out. Did he just win the WBC? Uh, Makabu. Makabu, yeah. Did he win it? No, he won the interim, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, so something like him. You know what I mean? Lawrence will knock him out, 100%. I think Lawrence is the best, best cruiserweight out there. Yeah, he's not the most polished, but he'll win a world title. And, uh, and he'll win it with not even reaching anywhere near his full capabilities. Once, give me another couple of years with him, and when we step up to heavyweight, you're going to see the best in him. Okay, well, it is 20 past three slash 20 past two. Um, quite an early finish. Uh, Shane McGregor, thanks very much uh, for speaking to Boxing Social. Congratulations again on another world title. Um, added to your your stable or your, your stable's collection, so to speak. Um, I know this was not would not have been an easy camp for yourself um, and Josh, given given what you'd both been through. So I commend you both on that, and, and know how difficult that must. Well, I don't know how difficult that must have been, which is kind of the point. Um, so congratulations. I hope Josh Taylor gets some rest, and I hope you get some rest. Um, oh, CBS is fighting, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> Jay Metcalf. Jay Metcalf, he says, come back to me. I'll beat Jay Metcalf in the amateur. So he's obviously a mate of his scouse. Um, bashed him up. Maybe put up on YouTube one time. Bashed me up as well once, the last time we shared a ring, didn't you? Nah, I didn't, mate. It was taking it easy with you. Uh, my best days are long gone as well, so don't worry about it. Okay. Um, Jay McGuigan, thanks very much. Uh, do appreciate your time and I do really mean that congratulations once again you've now joined the uh, fabled club of world boxing super series trainers yourself and Joe Gallagher um, so congratulations for that I know that would have really lit a fire underneath you so thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social I look forward to speaking to you soon thank you very much Rob as always